All right, welcome back. That was a fairly uh, brief break. I just had to change my nice layout of the slides because I noticed that with this light, it's very bright. You would not be able to see my otherwise very colorful slides, which look very nice on the laptop, but not very nice on the screen. I hope it is better now. Uh, I now sort of want to present one type of migration, transit migration. Uh, I actually have a book in uh, German, unfortunately. Uh, I can't even remember how it's called. International and Global Migration or something, where I collected Ten years ago, uh, all the types of migration I found in the literature. And I stopped at 80 different types of migration, like irregular migration, transit migration, labor migration, sunshine migration, transnational migration. Yo-yo migration is the one I remember best because it is so funny. So transit migration is one type of a huge and ever-growing typology <coughs> of migration. And what we try to do here, of course, is to make sense of this enormous global process of mobility and uh, migration and in this sort of massive amount of data and people um, understand similarities and differences and once by comparison we arrive at something specific that is different from something else that we have noticed before we give it a label one of these many labels is transit migration I have now broken down transit migration into, I think, 15 or 20 subtypes to make it ever more complicated, which is probably part of the joy of uh, any type of research and also research in migration. You come, something across, you come across something that is a bit different from what colleagues have observed before. You dig a little deeper, you ask your usual questions, and then you notice this is a specific type of behavior, which is different from other specific types of behavior, and you give it a label or a name, and if you are lucky, you will be remembered for the one who gave the label or name, and you might be famous for a week or a year, but then it's over because someone else has another, even better idea. So this is all the sort of notion of uh, transit migration. Do you know what transit migration might mean? I will deconstruct that, but just what is... As a changeable pattern, as a changeable condition of migration, uh, in terms of non-sustainable... Yes and no. <laughs> or uh, it changes of pattern when uh, some certain country uh, has some type of migration behavior or policy no. during some period. No, shifts. but very good you don't know, otherwise my lecture wouldn't oh, be very necessary. <laughs> so this is very good news for me, yes, thanks. Is it um, countries that you're traveling through to your, your final destination and maybe you have to stay there for a while or it ends up becoming per um, permanent? So it would be that country that you're so travel supposedly temporarily stay, stay mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, exactly. that wild, it could be permanent. What type of stay? What is for a while? Mm -hmm. So this is a good good starting point. But it's a politicized concept, it's a blurred concept. And I will uh, explain what I mean uh, with that. Uh, when I started... Mm, studying and researching transit migration about 10 years ago, it was just everywhere 
in the policy documents of the EU, the international organizations, the controllers of migration and also entered into the migration literature and everybody talked about the literature and first it is interesting and then it is annoying and then you noticed it's a little more complex than suggested. So then as a researcher you start sort of doing your job in order to understand uh, what is uh, going on there. In terms of the politicized notion, there was no, there, no, there was some historical reference to transit migration in the 1940s and uh, 50s, mostly with regards to refugees from uh, Nazi Germany who were traveling through France and Portugal in order to get uh, to the US and other uh, Western countries. But then it was reintroduced again in the 1990s by uh, the UN, the International Organization for Migration, uh, and I will sort of talk about that more in one of the other days, issued a whole range of very influential transit migration reports. They had identified countries like uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Ukraine, Turkey, and I can't remember, there is a whole series of transit migration through, and that was very obviously raising alarm in the West over these countries who, in the view of IOM, were not properly controlling migration. The International Center for Migration Policy Development is a very small Vienna-based intergovernmental organization, mainly concerned with the control uh, of uh, migration they set up an initiative that was then falling on fertile ground and uh, picked up by the Council of the European Union. There was a strategy paper on <coughs> transit migration. The high level working group, which is a very influential body of experts of the Council of Europe, sort of reinforced uh, that by further reports raising attention and awareness for the sort of issue of uh, transit migration and then mostly in the EU interestingly uh, various international intergovernmental corporations were set up mostly between the EU and the countries that were identified as transit countries, Western Mediterranean first, and uh, soon followed by Ukraine. Ukraine, in course of the so-called pseudo shipping process that has now been discontinued, it's now uh, the Eastern, uh, part of the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, Program, the cross-border cooperation process was set up in 2004, to address this issue of transit migration, which is indeed nothing else but countries through which migrants travel in order to get to their final destination. Uh, these are usually people who can't just get a visa and buy a ticket in order to regularly go where they want to go. So they've got to do it the long, hard, overland way, inevitably traveling through uh, one or more countries before arriving in the EU in particular. And uh, 
in course of better controlling its borders, preventing unwanted migration, it was uh, recognized and I was literally told by, for instance, Frontex officers that by the time this type of unwanted migrants arrive at the external borders of the EU, it's almost too late to stop them. It's literally one step and then you are on the other side. So policy uh, noticed and decided that in order to control migration, you've got to do that, as it is called, upstream, further down the road, to prevent people from getting anywhere near the border. And that has been initiated by these uh, fairly alarmist IOM reports, which always hugely exaggerated the numbers. So they like to talk about millions of people, hundreds and thousands of people, which was hugely exaggerated, and I will explain uh, why that is. ICMPD uh, wasn't um, any better, so the shipping process wasn't um, any better. So the concept was politicized in that it had a political purpose. The purpose was to raise alarm, to shake up the governments and suggest that something must be done in all these countries between the sending country and the receiving country, which were suggested to be transit migrants not doing a good job in controlling and preventing uh, uh, migration. So that was the political notion. And if you draw a map, this is... Oh, why didn't anybody tell me that this is much better? So when, when you look at all the reports, this is not very sort of visible from where you sit, I suppose. Sort of the perspective is here is the EU countries, and in a very again Eurocentric perspective, looked at migration and mobility patterns from Brussels or Berlin or France or London. There is a band of countries around the EU stretching from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, uh, not so much uh, Israel, but Lebanon, Turkey, and then uh, you have uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, which represent the neighborhood of the European Union, uh, which are partly in the vicinity of volatile regions where you have conflict, poverty, inequality, persecution, whether it's in parts of Africa, whether it's in the Middle East, or whether it's in the sort of East and Southeast Asia, and uh, which had, as I've explained before, partly fairly liberal visa regimes. So it is rather uncomplicated to just buy the Turkish airline ticket from Democratic Republic of Congo somewhere here to fly via Casablanca <coughs> to Istanbul and then it's only 100 kilometers and you are in the EU or to fly from uh, Sudan or Egypt, if you are from uh, the east of Africa, Somalia, Eritrea, go to Sudan, go to Cairo, fly to Istanbul, get to Europe, or uh, via Dubai to Istanbul, and from various uh, East and Southeast Asian countries, again, often Istanbul, but in the past, Moscow, was a major turntable from where few people went directly to Finland, very, very few to my surprise, 
mostly the route went from the Moscow airports yeah. to Kiev and then overland to the border with Hungary, Slovakia and into the EU. So from the perspective of the lawmakers in Brussels and London and elsewhere, that was fairly frightening and the idea was how can we stop not only this from like say Morocco to Spain, but how can we sort of address and prevent people arriving in Morocco or Turkey or Ukraine in the first uh, instance. So lots of similar maps, and I will show some tomorrow, I think, were produced as part of this alarmist, politicized notion of transit migration, almost depicting not research knowledge but investigative knowledge. So the boundaries between researching and investigating became rather blurred, which also challenges migration, because as a, as a migration researcher, you ask yourself, what can you publish? How do you publish that? If you don't want to become part of an investigative apparatus like European border guards, Frontex, Europol and what else uh, there is. So this map was emerging with a belt of countries depicted on my laptop but not here in yellow which were sort of targeted by this uh, political transit migration approach. But what is transit migration has never been very clear. Uh, there are very blurred definitions and I just sort of quote a couple here. A stopover of passage of varying lengths. Now what is it? One day, one week, one month, one year? While traveling between two or more countries. Uh, either incidental or continuous transportation, or for the purpose of changing plates or chain joining an ongoing flight or other mode of transportation. So that was the definition of the International Organization for Migration. It sounds a bit like it's everything and nothing. Or, or I can't remember what IPU is. Aliens who stay in the country for some period of time while seeking to migrate permanently to another country. Some period of time sounds very vague. Refugees awaiting resettlement. Okay, now it's about refugees. It's no longer about migrants. People who enter the territory of the same in order to travel on to another Council of Europe. Stay for how long? It's very, very vague. Short-term temporary stay of migrant on his or her way from a country of origin to a country of destination. Okay, short term, we don't know. Country of origin, we don't know. Country of destination, we don't know. Destination, final destination, we know people move on and on and on. So this is again very vague. The stage between emigration and settlement. I mean, I don't know, this is extremely uh, blurred. Intention of transit migrants which lies in the continuation of their journey. Intentions change all the time. They are shaped by migration environment. So it's another very uh, complex and in migration studies contested <coughs> concept, intentions, because intentions are dynamic. So that's neglected here. A person who is there but does not want to be there. I don't know where I got this from, but this is sort of the weirdest sort of attempt to define transit migration. On this basis, policy was made. On this basis, the EU went to Ukraine and Turkey and Morocco and negotiate international relations in the field of migration control, which is problematic in its own right. So that leads to a whole range of epistemological problems. How long or short is transit supposed to last to be interpreted 
as transit migration, after which lengths of stay does <coughs> transit turn into at least temporary immigration? What if an immigrant has no intention to move on, but changes his or her mind and moves to another country? Is it then transit migration or what? How can we be sure there is a country of final destination? Where can we draw the line between transit migration, repeated migration, continuous mobility, serial migration, where people move from one country to the other, but in each country stay for longer periods of time? Are migrants who intend or just dream to reach another final destination, but never actually put this into practice, really transit migrants. Here, Ahmed Ichdulgo suggests yes. The intention of transit migration, which lies in the continuation of their journey. This is the intention, according to him, that makes someone a transit migrant. But what if the transit migrant never manages to put this into practice? Is it then still a transit migrant or just an immigrant dreaming of moving somewhere else? But who are these migrants? How are they? What is their legal status? Lots of uh, question marks. And what we have in this notion of transit migration is an expression of various biases. Bias number one is the economic bias, the assumption that everybody want to move to Europe because that's the richest region in that part of the world. There is no good reason to stay in Russia, Egypt, Ukraine, Turkey, Libya or Morocco. The people who are there must want to move on to Europe. So this is classical and neoclassical migration theory thinking. There is an income discrepancy, a wealth discrepancy. People want to go where they get the maximum return. This is nonsense, we know that. But this is the economic bias which informs the notion of transit migration. The third country nationals in Turkey or Ukraine they must be transit migrants, for sure, because the EU is so rich, so they all want to go there. That leads to a numerical bias, that all the foreigners in Ukraine or Turkey or Libya or Morocco have no reason to live and stay in these countries. They want to go to Europe. And this is why you find in the literature IOM claiming one million people in Libya, all transit migrants, they want to go to Europe because they can't just accept that Libya in the past and still, because it's an oil producing and therefore rich country with lots and lots of income opportunities, is a destination country. So everybody in Libya must be the transit migrants, and then they arrive at these hugely inflated numbers of one million people here and one million people there. Academics tell them forever it's nonsense, but they don't want to believe, they don't want to listen, because if they've got to admit that it's not one million, but only 50,000 people, then how would you be able to mobilize millions of euro for your migration prevention programs. Then I have explained the Eurocentric bias is depicted here. It is mostly believed in the capitals of Europe that people on the move are on their way to Europe and they can't quite believe and accept that there are other countries and parts and cities in the world where you can also have a decent life and also find a job and also rebuild a family, whether it's uh, in Kiev or in Istanbul or in uh, Cairo or wherever. There is a very racial bias because the people 
you talk about are obviously most of the time not white. They are not Christian. So there is this sort of bias with regards to the background of the people migrating. There is this political bias suggesting that governments in non-EU countries are not good enough, don't bother, don't do enough about migration control. And uh, there is a normative bias, not at least suggesting that most of what is going on here is irregular, is illegal, is criminal, which also is not true because of the very liberal visa regimes in many of these countries. Most mobility is actually perfectly regular. It's only this last stage of the journey when people want to move on. They face barriers of passport controls and visa requirements which turns one part of this migration process irregular. The rest normally isn't actually. So in terms of a typology, the A to Z would be the ideal regular version of migration. You have money, you have an accepted biography, you have a passport, you therefore get a visa and travel regularly by whatever plane or bus from one country to the other. If you don't feel fulfill one or all of these criteria and the border becomes closed for that individual, there is a second choice country. Someone from Iran or Vietnam might travel to Ukraine first. Someone from Morocco, because it's a visa-free travel regime, might travel to Istanbul first. The border between country A and B is relatively open, and the border between B and C, because of the various regimes of uh, migration control and border secure security, might still be relatively porous because the control system isn't perfect or because the geography is difficult to control. Mountains, deserts, the open sea is different to control. The border is relatively porous but often dangerous to cross. That's why I have this sort of this, this skull here. This is like a sort of schema of the sort of geopolitics of uh, transit migration. And in this context, I would identify not only two or three types of countries, not only sending, not only origin, but more. It all starts with the country of origin. But there are often more countries along uh, the road. These can be stage posts. These can be countries of temporary immigration. These can be countries that uh, migrants travel through very quickly, within a couple of hours or days. I have listed a few here. The country that raises the alarm in the EU most are those countries in the immediate neighborhood of the EU from where people depart in order to arrive in the EU. I call them uh, the stepping stone countries here, but I'm not sure this is a very good sort of depiction. Ukraine is one of those countries, Serbia now, Turkey, Libya, Cape Verde is in the past, Morocco is uh, sort of on the agenda again. 
But then there is also the first country of arrival in the EU, Slovakia, Hungary, Greece, and so on. But people don't stay normally in these countries. So de facto, these are also transit countries. But in the policy documents, in the literature, they are never labeled transit countries. So this reflects the political bias. Only nine EU countries are labeled transit countries. Greece or Italy or Spain or uh, Slovakia are never labeled transit countries, even though they are, because the arrivals don't stay there. <coughs> they move on to Austria, Germany, France. And sometimes you find this is still not the final destination country. You talk to people, you follow them on Facebook or LinkedIn, and suddenly they are in the US, they are in Canada, they are in Australia. That might be the final destination countries. But then, a couple of years later, I had a couple of such cases, people write me from Egypt. So they went back to the global south because they noticed that the promises of the El Dorado, North or West Europe and America didn't materialize. Life was too complicated. Or they failed to reunite their families. They couldn't get family reunification and it was easier for them to bring the dispersed family together in countries with less strict migration regimes like Egypt. So I, in particular, sort of came across this sort of uh, mechanism in the case of Somalis who went to Europe, who went to the US, couldn't sort of reunite their family and then decided they all come together uh, in uh, Egypt. In this geopolitics and in the literature you find references to transit zones or transit spaces and to nodal points, but a much better word are hubs. A transit migration hub is a turntable where flows, routes, movements from different parts of the world converge and they converge in these hubs Istanbul is one, Izmir is one, uh, Tripoli in Libya is one, Tangier in Morocco is one. In the past, uh, Kiev was one, but that's no longer the case. So the hubs are characterized by the only presence of services. There are cheap hotels, there are transportations, there are smugglers, there are employment opportunities for people who need to raise money to pay for onward uh, transportation. There are human rights organizations, NGOs supporting uh, people uh, uh, in sort of managing affairs and staying in a place. So these hubs are fairly important locations in the geopolitics of uh, transit migration where one would study matters. And then there is this whole notion of sort of the time dimension of uh, migration. Um, according to UN definitions, that's now globally, commonly acknowledged, for the purpose of migration control administration bureaucracy. So this is completely arbitrary. These are thresholds set by bureaucrats in order to develop their categories and their policies. The agreement by and large is any stay of 12 months or more is immigration. Anything between three in 12 months is temporary immigration. According to this definition, I would suggest that strictly speaking, 
taking the dimension of time, transit migration must be less than a stay of uh, three months. And again, this is fairly arbitrary. A distinction can be made and should be made between transit migration and mere transit. What I did yesterday, changing flight in Warsaw, staying there for three hours, not leaving the airport, was transit. There was no migration involved here. That was only travel. It was a journey. Anything more than one week, we could also say one month, this is open to a sort of discussion. So between one week and uh, three months, or one month and three months, we could probably uh, speak about transit migration. This is a lot more precise than uh, what we have read here. Various lengths, stay, awaiting, temporary stay, in between stage. So, <coughs> acknowledging different type of patterns. And I will relate that, and unfortunately I didn't prepare a slide for that. In 2015, I, collect, I, I conducted with colleagues a study on uh, the European Middle Eastern refugee crisis and uh, we conducted 500 sort of semi-in-depth structured interviews with uh, recent arrivals from Libya and Turkey in the EU. And our findings showed three very distinct patterns of mobility. Exactly one third of the people we found were traveling fairly fast within three months, but often less from where they come from to Greece or Italy. People were traveling much faster in the Eastern Mediterranean, so people <coughs> arrived in Greece much faster than in Italy. Uh, many made it from Syria, Pakistan, uh, Iraq, Morocco, not only to Greece, but even to Germany and Sweden within 10 days. They were partly very well organized and relatively well off. So, well educated, online on their gadgets all the time. They had money, credit cards, they knew English and whatever other language. And they even had booked their tickets online in advance. That was not the impression that people got from the media description. People showed me their folder. I've got the ferry tickets uh, uh, here from uh, the Greek islands to Athens. I've got my book, my, my bus book to the border with Macedonia. From there I take a taxi. I've got a telephone number. I just need to call the guy. And then uh, I know the train to Hungary, Austria, and so on. It was partly booked and printed, and partly they were exactly uh, they were at least uh, very well prepared. The same on the side, uh, sort of to the departure points in Turkey. They came by flight or by bus. They had their ticket. They had their ticket from the airport in Istanbul to Izmir, and only this very short stretch across the border into the EU was uh, sort of irregular, disorganized ad hoc part of the journey. One part, one third of our respondents took between three months and one and a half years. That was much more likely in the case 
of arrivals in Italy who were traveling from various parts of East or West Africa <coughs> to Libya where the routes converged. They very often stayed in various, not only one, but two or three other countries along the road, uh, often to work, to live there for a while, to make some money before deciding to move on and I come to that in my next slide and one third of our of our sample which is not uh, generalizable but still indicative of sort of the overall pattern one third had lived in other countries for more than 18 months if we sort of take out of the equation the exceptions we found a very large proportion in this third group who had lived in other countries for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Afghans had normally lived in Iran for 10, 20 years. Um, Eritreans had often lived in Israel or Egypt or Sudan for uh, many years. West Africans had often lived in other countries in the region for many years, in particular Nigeria, but also in Mali. So they were, according to this definition, immigrants in another country, or at least temporary migrants in another country, before moving on. Not actually, strictly speaking, transit migrants. Uh, yes, I hope you can read that. The next dimension is, of course, the intention of migration. And there are various sort of patterns of behavior that we find. There is intended migration. The intention to transit another country is there from the very outset. Someone leaves uh, Syria with a very clear intention to only travel fairly quickly through Turkey in order to get to Greece and then to Germany or Sweden, for instance. So this is intended transit. And they manage to realize this fairly quickly, within three months. Then there is unintended transit. And the question is whether this is then actually transit. Because, in this case, the intention would, for instance, be to leave Syria and seek shelter in Turkey. But then, it turns out that conditions aren't great there. People were giving a seven-year waiting period for their first asylum interview. Seven years in order to regularize your status, rebuild family, get kids to school, find a job, who on earth would do that? I wouldn't. So adverse conditions propel people onward. The intention was to stay, but they quickly realized this is nonsense, it's impossible, I've got to move on, so unintended transit. Maybe within three months, but that can also take longer. It might well be that people try hard to gain a status, obtain permission to work, settle down, rebuild family life and give up after 9 or 12 months. <coughs> Is it temporary immigration? Is it immigration and onward migration? Is it transit migration? Difficult to say. Then we have of course failed transit. We have all these people who left Iraq, traveled through Turkey, wanted to get to Europe as quickly as possible, but they failed. There was no smuggler. The border was closed. They were arrested. They were put in detention. So there was a clear intention, but they failed. And then there is the dream of transit. There is a dream of moving on to Europe. And I had interviewed many, many uh, foreigners in Ukraine 
very often from various African countries who would all tell me they are on their way to Europe, they want to go to Europe. They have been here for 10, 12, even 20 years. So definitely not in transit, but they maintain this myth. They present themselves as being in transit, whereas in fact they are not. So this again is another sort of complication adding to the complexity of this whole notion what kind of migration it is that uh, we deal with. The legal status is very often discussed in this concept, in this context of transit migration. The politicized notion of transit migration equalizes transit migration with illegal migration. This is all illegal. But most of the time it is not. Entry into the transit country, because it's often visa free, is not actually illegal. Stay in this country because of a more liberal regime is often also not irregular. People stay there regularly. Exit from the transit country is often unauthorized. People don't have permission to exit and they don't have permission to enter the next country, like Italy or Greece or Hungary. But once in the EU, they usually apply for asylum, so they regularize their status, so they are on the records again, and all else is more or less regular again. So the only irregular element in transit migration is normally the crossing of borders between these two uh, sort of spheres of migration which I had depicted in my previous lecture, crossing the zone of convergence where you have migration controls and visa requirements and whatnot. So it's not as irregular as normally uh, suggested. So here you have the four dimensions of transit migration. There is a geopolitics, there is a time, there is the intention and there is the legal status. And I came up with this. You can't probably read this. It's not very important because it changes all the time. I change it all the time. This is an attempt to break this huge blurred notion of transit migration into the many different patterns I found. If you are ever inclined to do any migration studies and you come across anything to do that vaguely resembles sort of continuous mobility, don't fall for the simple notion of transit migration, but take into account these various dimensions, ask in your interviews, dig a little uh, deeper in order to better understand what is really going on there, and also take into account sort of the scale between uh, forced uh, and voluntary migration. When, when studying transit migration, there are a couple of methodological challenges. Uh, I often advise students on their research questionnaires or question guidelines and I often find the way they ask questions very suggestive. So they are already indicating in the question what they are after. You are a transit migrant, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Last question. 
Yes, I mean, this is a bit of a sort of too obvious uh, sort of uh, example, but this kind of more or less directly or in a subtle fashion suggesting what you are after generates the kind of answers you are after. You can also ask, do you want to go to Europe? And everybody will happily jump up and down and say, oh yes, of course. But it's a dream. It's completely unrealistic. So then we need to test these kind of intentions. Do you want to go to Europe or to Canada or wherever? People would say yes. But then you can sort of cross-checking in order to find out how realistic this might be. I would ask, do you have family members or friends in Europe? And if people say yes, then there is a chance that there is a network effect. Network effect means if someone has relatives or friends in the destination country, the probability that you want to go there yourself is much higher. You know someone, you have a contact, there are people who help you, you get information there, they give you a head over the roof once you arrive, so the risks are greatly diminished. So. That's the first indication that there is more than just the dream. The second question would be, which languages do you speak? If people speak foreign languages, in particular the language of the destination country, English or French or German or Turkish or Russian or whatever it is, it again becomes more likely that this dream could become reality. Uh, do people have money? Can you pay for the journey? No, I don't have a penny. You immediately know this is a mere dream. It, it won't uh, work out. Do you work? Yes. Do you manage to save money for your journey? No. My salary is too small. So you know immediately this is sort of transit migration dream that won't materialize. Do you have a passport? Do you have a visa? Do you have papers? Do you make contacts to smugglers? Do you talk to people? So there are lots of questions you can ask in order to test how serious the intention is. Uh, I can't remember what I meant when I put strategies here. Uh, the issue of risk-taking is important <coughs> in the research of transit migration because we know that individuals respond very differently to risk. Some are very, very risk adverse. They would not do anything or go for something that for them is too risky, too dangerous. So risk can be a deterrent. Uh, other people are much more resilient with regard to risk. They are prepared to take much higher risk they might say, it's all in the hand of God, inshallah. You hear that all the time, inshallah. You always hear people making calculations. Only 1% dies. That won't be me. I hope it's not me. It's worth the risk taking. So people make these calculations between lifelong hardship of life at home or a two or three day risk of crossing the sea with the perspective of having a much better life subsequently, not immediately, once in Europe. So people make these calculations and then decide it is worth taking the risk. Because if I manage and survive, in the long run it will pay off. Also, the issue of human agency 
comes uh, into play because a lot of what is going on here, because it involves irregular border crossings, that is something migrants can no longer arrange on their own. They need to turn to facilitators who do this professionally as a business. They are denoted as uh, human uh, smugglers and uh, they are basically leaving certain practices to uh, human smugglers and uh, that can lead to successful migration it can lead to a loss of life if you have a ruthless unethical smuggler who is only after quick money but I must say this is the minority most smugglers provide relatively good safe services you can say that from the number of people that arrive in a place uh, like Europe uh, safely but there are of course also the cheats who take the money and don't deliver then the journey is over, the savings are gone. Four or five family members, 10,000 euro, that's about it. So agency is limited by the different uh, actors in the field. How can we theorize and uh, conceptualize uh, transit migration? I look at it and that's why the order of my presentations uh, makes sense through the notion of uh, migration transition. Many of the EU neighborhood countries are actually migration transition countries. They attract immigration, they display emigration, and there is a uh, transit migration and very often we found but not always that the countries depicted by policy as transit countries are actually immigration countries many more people immigrate and stay than people leave the best example for me always was Libya when Libya was very big in the media uh, and IOM suggested there are one million transit migrants in Libya whereas in the same year only 50,000 people left Libya and went to Europe whereas all others 950,000 people not only stayed in Libya but they had a job there they worked there, they lived there some had their uh, family, their uh, wife and uh, children and uh, many, and I interviewed Bengalis and Filipinos and Algerians and Moroccans they said, oh no, why should I go to Europe? Life is good here. That was before the crisis, before the war and everything. Oil producing country, rich, lots of jobs. <coughs> They had good jobs, they were doctors and nurses, engineers, construction workers and, and all the rest of it. So the transit migrants were not de facto transit migrants. They were mostly 95% immigrants. And that sort of relates to this migration transition where countries had become uh, transit countries. We have this overlapping migration systems. I have uh, suggested that then uh, we need to acknowledge there is also migration not only to the high income countries but also to low and middle income countries that's not accepted by classical migration theories suggesting everybody goes to the rich countries but this is uh, nonsense uh, there are uh, class determinants in all of that because the less affluent people who don't have the right um, education, job, money, bank account are excluded from uh, migration to the first choice countries so they go to the second choice countries we have these uh, uh, migration uh, 
frontiers uh, distinguishing between in the migration order between the different types of uh, uh, countries and these sort of groups of countries, visa free and non visa free. I've said that uh, we have the socio economic determinants uh, of uh, uh, transit uh, migration. Either people find a job and notice they can stay, so why should I move on? Or the opposite, they move to another country, Turkey, want to rebuild life, no permission to work, they can't stay, they move on. So we have this sort of element when we theorize about transit migration. The hubs of uh, transit migration I have managed, this is rather looking at the geography of this kind of movement, when we look at the routes, hubs and bottlenecks. And then, of course, the interaction between migrant strategies and expanding uh, control regimes. People become involuntary immigrants because they want to transit, but they can't move on. This is one phenomenon. The other phenomenon is that if controls are imposed in one part of the world, then another country sort of arises uh, on the migration map. We could see that very clearly in the Mediterranean in the past the main sort of point of departure was Morocco, then the Strait of Gibraltar was tightly controlled, people migrated via the Canary Islands, then the beaches were controlled, they departed from further south, from Senegal, that was also controlled, then Libya became the main sort of hub for transit migration, the war broke out, more people moved to Turkey, Turkey the border was controlled, now it is Libya again, and to some extent I think that also explained why the role of Ukraine in all this sort of transit uh, uh, migration um, changed, because it was a key country in the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s. Abruptly ended in 2006 and uh, some of the migration corridors, as some scholars uh, depict that, were actually moved from Ukraine to Turkey that we could clearly see in the case of Somalis who in the mid-2000s were traveling to Germany through Ukraine in relatively large numbers and I could trace back the emergence of two Somali refugee communities in Munich and in Frankfurt about 13 or 15,000 people who were all traveling through uh, Ukraine. They were all coming through the Gulf countries, flew into Russia, met uh, the smuggling facilitator, normally taxi drivers, who took them to some safe houses, collected a group of people, put them in a lorry, took them down towards uh, uh, the Ukrainian border, not using the motorway because that was controlled. By night, uh, walk people across the border, sometimes through the swamps, uh, to areas near the Sumer region. They were normally apprehended, put in some kind of uh, holding facility, relatively <coughs> humane conditions, I must say, were then released in order to apply for asylum, went to Kiev, applied, went to Vinica, where you had a key, and I only talk about that because it's a long time ago, where you had a key Somali facilitator who was collaborating with the Secret Service and the border guards who gathered people there, facilitated their migration to Zakarpatia, Uzgorod, from where they moved on either Slovakia or Hungary. It changed year by year. It was sort of a cross-border system of 
corruption and along various stage posts where you had other Somalis. In Budapest there was a Somali community, in Vienna was a Somali community, in Salzburg, Austria was an important person, so people moved along this corridor to Munich and uh, Frankfurt, and in the end there were 13,000 people. They are all happily recognized refugees, well educated, uh, highly ambitious, learned the language, went into uh, vocational training, learned a trade, got a job, and now are in the process of family reunification. They managed uh, relatively well. Uh, I think I should. Where is Olex say? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we still. Uh, we, we have some time. Yes. Some Fifteen minutes. So. Yes, for questions, discussions, and uh, whatnot. I talk too much, I know. But talking to you over my slides is always more time consuming than uh, what I intended to do. Yes. Um, well, from a few things you've said, especially at the end here, it sounds like the refugee system um, and is extremely corrupt in some way, that it seems to benefit mainly people who have the money to travel through Russia, through Ukraine in the period that it takes to get to Germany or through Southern Europe and pay the uh, people smugglers. I just wonder if you could all, like, and maybe not the people who are in need most of all, but the ones that are financially capable of making that journey. Um, I was, just wonder if you could elaborate on that. Uh, I talk quite a bit about Ukraine, mm -hmm. only because we are all in Ukraine now, and even though what I have observed is now basically over, but you find sort of similar patterns and structures in uh, Turkey. It is indeed often the case that the people who make it finally, for instance, this way to the EU or US and Canada are fairly well educated. It was very, very obvious in the case of the 2015-2016 refugees. These were affluent, urban, middle-class populations. 75% of all arrivals in Germany had at least secondary education. 48% had a university degree. And that tells you the class structure of this kind of migration. It's know-how and know-how to pay. So without knowing and managing sort of these kind of environments and without being able to pay for that, it becomes uh, fairly difficult. Mm, I think that's one part of the answer to your question. It also tells us a lot about the drivers of onward migration. As I've suggested when I refer to the three uh, uh, types of mobility patterns we found amongst refugees in 2015-2016, many do actually first try to stay in the first safe country in which they arrive, which could be Ukraine, Turkey, Libya, Egypt, Morocco, even Sudan. But they face such adverse conditions that sooner or later they give up and they move on. They are propelled onward by the conditions. They decide conditions are not viable, they won't stay. And the key problem is a secure uh, migration status. They can't get asylum, they can't get permission to work, they can't get a residence permit, or they have one and policy or regime changes and uh, they can't get uh, 
in extension, which has been the case with many Syrians in Egypt. Before the military coup and the government changed and this army general Sisi came to power, Syrians got a residence permit. After the coup, Sisi changed that and people could not get their residence permit extended. So they were illegal, irregular. So they were basically expected to go somewhere else. Where could that be? Some took the flight to Istanbul, others took the bus overland uh, to Libya. So these, the precarity of the status and the lack of protection or security provided uh, by respective authorities plays a major role. When I studied this Somali migration through Ukraine, in all these years, only one Somali ever got a refugee status. All others were rejected. Many of them had been apprehended and put in detention for six months and some repeatedly. They got the message, Ukraine is not for them. We are not welcome, we won't get a status, we can't settle down, we've got to go. Because going back was not an option, not for a Somali, where can you go? Does that answer your question? Yes. It was a long answer again, <laughs> sorry. Yes. I want to give a comment uh, mm. from my perspective from literature. Because uh, I thank you for your lecture to the lecture. I have just my thoughts about how migration also has this influence on literature, and especially uh, in Ukrainian literature, we have a lot of new uh, novels in that. And I also I know this uh, William Blacker. He has his play, which is called Bloody East Europeans. Yes. Uh, so it's also like have all of these um, issues with like that. And in Ukrainian, uh, for instance, Vasily Makhnov, the uh, of Baking in Holocaust, the house in Baking in Holocaust, this um, like novels about that. Um, so we could say that migration also has this uh, influence on literature, on culture, and plus now uh, it's also. <laughs> Um, also, uh, write uh, readings that will like will be in Lviv and a few other town in Europe. And honorable um, guest this year is uh, Turkey. So uh, the most famous um, authors will come to this town. They will, will represent their uh, poems, and novels, and culture. So it's also something new with this going on in this area. So what do you think on that issue? How migration um, has influenced culture? I, I, I knew that mostly we talk about economic and um, all of that, but culture. Well, it, it always felt to me that sort of in a increasingly interconnected world uh, migration is becoming the normal and not the exceptional and the arrival of different people and the diversity this brings with it is kind of a normalization. In historical terms, it's always been there and sort of the organization of humanity in nation states with borders and the very clear notion of belonging is a relatively modern concept. It doesn't seem to work very well and it, it seems to me to conflict with this anthropological continuum of mobility simply because we have two legs and we are curious and we want to see and learn we roam around 
And 90% of what we do is within these artificial borders of a nation state. So it's not really problematized a lot. It's not really noted a lot. But we are mobile all the time. Very few people die where they were born. You go to school, you go to university, you go to work, you go where your husband or wife is from, and people change within these borders and boundaries. And of course, this is then sort of taken up in, uh, in the literature. What I refer to at the very beginning, the first notion of transit migration in the 19, uh, sort of 40s, 50s literature. This is literature. This is not academic. Uh, there is this Anna Seger's book, Transit Migration. I have seen it, but I haven't read it. But there are quite some sort of novels looking at mobility in the 1930s. And I'm not surprised that uh, we see that now again. I would probably like to know more about uh, your references, but if they are in Ukrainian, then I can't read them, I'm afraid. But there are more and more uh, good uh, translations, I notice. Anything else you want to say or ask or comment? Or we'll share, share, we'll say. Yeah. share share an observation. Yes, please, Amber. Um, actually, I just have a question about one of your um, criteria indicators, and that's this notion of resiliency. I've read a lot of scholarship lately on how that is quantified or measured, either um, qualitatively or quantitatively. So I'm wondering, like, what do you think? How do you define resiliency, and how are you actually measuring resiliency? Oh, I don't, <laughs> and I wouldn't know sort of out of my head how to do it. It's something I also... Have you got a suggestion? I actually don't have a solid one yet. Um, the scholarship is kind of like mo focusing more on the individual background or the national climate from the Sydney country. Um, but I still haven't gotten anything concrete from somebody, but it is a word that is thrown around quite a bit, so... I'm, I have recently been working with uh, Albert Hirschman's uh, theory, voice exit loyalty. So, suggesting that people in an unfavorable position have three options. Voice means they can protest and say, I don't like it. Exit, very obviously, you leave. You leave your organization, you leave uh, your country. Uh, loyalty is staying put and putting up with matters, which also resembles resilience. So these are the people facing the same conditions as others, but they are less unhappy about that. And we did a study, and it's all online, all the data and reports, you imagine. You imagining, imagining Europe from the outside, we studied Ukraine, Turkey, Senegal, and Morocco, and people's ambitions with regard to uh, staying or leaving. And the greatest puzzle in migration studies, which has not yet been studied or under, understood, is how it comes that so few people migrate. If you have 2 billion poor people in the world, if you have only 250,000 million immigrants, how, how can we explain that people under the most unfavorable conditions stay, that people with migration aspirations nevertheless stay? How does it come in our interviews that two interviewees in the same oblast the same rayon, the same social class, because they live in the same apartment block. Very similar sort of social, economic, and family conditions have two completely different aspirations. I want to leave. Tomorrow, if I could, I would never leave. I stay in Ukraine. How does it come? 
And at that time, we did it, I think, six, five, six years ago, uh, we were not prepared yet for this response, and therefore our questionnaire wasn't geared up for that. But it was coming out that people were putting different value, for instance, to family life. I have all my family here. This is so important for me. This is my life. I would never give it up. And others also have family, but for them, making better money, having a better life abroad, going somewhere else was more important. People were all very critical about everyday corruption. Some were so fed up they just wanted to leave as soon as possible and others played the system. They were more resilient. But what defines this more or less resilience? I don't know. But lots and lots of similar examples where people in exactly the same position came to completely different conclusions about their life. They were still more happy there, they were less happy there. It's the glass is half full, the glass is half empty issue. Sort of where people put the emphasis. It's an extremely interesting question and lots of colleagues now notice and talk about that. We are not yet there to study that, not to mention any literature. It's a, yeah. just a comment to add, but I wondered what you thought of it. I previously done quite a lot of work with freelance journalists and trauma, and resilience is a really big buzzword in that kind of work, and I wondered whether you considered using any of the techniques to measure that and applied it to, to this context, or what you think would be the, the challenges of doing that. Just a couple of people. Can we call them? Stubborn. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's unmeasurable. There is no some kind of variable which would allow us to measure. I'm not it's sure. Very I philosophical. Think, I think what we need is indeed more cross disciplinary collaboration, which at the moment we don't have. We have in migration studies a deficit of uh, psychology. We have anthropology, we have economics, sociology, but psychology is really missing there. And I think we might <coughs> be able to understand a lot better if we go sort of to the very micro level of the micro level. The micro level of sociology we have, but psychology not. So there is uh, fortunately still a lot to do which gives us our jobs. <laughs> Uh, um, can you remind us the name of author which wrote about voice exemplarity? Albert Hirschman, with one M, I think. He is Austrian or German Jew, Jew. migrating to the US in the 40s. And his book is about uh, people's behavior in organizations, not, not states. Okay. But it's been applied to migration a lot, for instance, to the Syrian refugee crisis. I have an, a journal article, which is in a no-name Czech journal, but the advantage is it's in English and it's open access. Geography. So if you Google my name, Hirschman Voice Exit, you should find it. Still a bit difficult. And Hirschman also applied his concept to the 1989 revolution, transformation, migration from Eastern Europe. And there it becomes really interesting because I relate Eastern European sort of transition and migration to the transition and migration revolution in Syria. Doesn't convince everybody, but uh, I think I have a point. Yeah, it's uh, so interesting because there are some uh, kind of theories, especially uh, it uh, reminds me of the theory of uh, Ted Gurr, 
uh, why men uh, rebels, why men rebels, and in this sense the reasons, the different comprehensive roots of uh, rebellion, social rebellion. So we can find some kind of comparative with uh, the theory of our impression. There is a whole literature on migration as an expression of uh, claims making and social movement. Mm -hmm. uh, autonomy of migration, the theories on subjectivity, on human agency is partly very closely related to migration as a social movement, as an alternative to voice protest. It seems to me like they can exist simultaneously. So one could like project or perform loyalty to the state outwardly, but inwardly perform actions of resistance. So it's not necessarily like one or the other, but there are things that are working at different levels. That's exactly what I say in my article, that uh, it's much more mm -hmm. complex. It's often voice followed by exit, the case of Syria. It's exit followed by voice. People leave the country, find a close border, and then they start sort of protesting. It can be any possible combination, and it becomes really interesting sort of to take this rather simple dichotomy almost of Hirschman and sort of use it as a template to analyze contemporary processes to understand and then refine the whole uh, theory. Shall we leave it there? Time for lunch. <laughs>